I'm blessed this morning, not only to have my beloved wife, but my only son, David, raise your hand. Well, he's, uh, he's a big guy, and uh, every time I'm with him, I feel protected, amen? <laughs> I don't want to ring too much. Am I ringing too much? Okay. We'll adjust it. Okay. Okay. When I was invited to preach, I always like to do a series. I just do it that way. Every once in a while I do a single sermon. And I was praying about what to do. One of my favorite series that I've done over the years was eight messages that answered the question, who is Jesus? Very important. And so, uh, every time I'm invited to preach here, I'll take one of these. When I have eight, then it's all over. I mean, no. <laughs> By the way, as you know, I love just to be here. I don't have to preach. I just enjoy being part of the FCF fellowship. It's a good thing. And I always feel blessed. So this morning we're beginning the title of the message is The Bread. The Bread. And I hope everybody has an outline. I hope I brought enough. As we continue to grow, I hope I don't have enough. I hope I get more. The Jews, therefore, were grumbling about him. Because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. Father, speak to us this morning. Because it's all about Jesus. Not about preachers or churches or whatever, but it begins and ends with Jesus Christ. So be with us this morning. May we honor you. May we remember who you are. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Moses tried a number of ways to weasel out of the incredibly difficult task that God had laid on him there at the burning bush. As my brother mentioned, you didn't know I was going to talk about Moses. It's interesting. God has a sense of humor. You know, and he makes a bald-headed preacher who stands up here with his head down like this. And he still preaches. To bring Israel out of Egypt. And then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, Why is his name? What shall I say to them? And underline this, if you will. And God said to Moses, <clears throat> I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Each of the eight messages in this who is Jesus series focuses on one of the things that Jesus says he is in the Gospel of John. And each time he says who he is, as for example in our text this morning, he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. He deliberately uses the same phrase that God the Father used to describe to Moses who he was. In other words, I am. At a later occasion, his enemies clearly understood what 
he claimed about himself when he said, I am. Because they picked up stones to throw at him. When Jesus asked them which good work they were going to stone him for, they replied, and hang on here, please change that 8 to a 10. That's the first mistake I've made for a long time. <laughs> and uh, I said, wait a minute. I looked it up because I wanted to read it again. And it's John 10, 33. And Jesus asked them which good work, which is kind of a sarcastic way of speaking at him, they were going to stone him for, they replied in John 10, 33, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. By the way, if something happens that you have to move somewhere, and you're not able to get any more of these messages over the period of months that God uses me and you see fit to have me here. Um, remember that the issue when it comes to Jesus Christ, He said, I am. And I am that I am. And he says that he is the only one who can save. So never, ever become uh, sort of blasé with Jesus and say, well, he was just a little mistaken. Jesus was either Lord or he was a liar or a lunatic. Because there was no doubt that the leaders who dealt with him knew what he said. No one comes to the Father except by me. So when he said, I am, I am, and the, the Greek word is ego, a me. I alone, in contradistinction to everyone and everything in the world, am this. And he was identifying himself with God the Father back there as he talked with Moses. That's why Christ's opponents in Capernaum were so ticked off at him. They knew he wasn't describing himself as just a, a chunk of Wonder Bread. <laughs> By the way, I, I didn't put it in the outline here, but it's very important. In those days especially, bread meant something to that bunch of people there in Israel. It was not just a simple thing like we go to McDonald's and get a couple of buns and you know, meat in between. Bread was very important. When Jesus talked about being the bread of life, it was a very serious thing. When he said he had come down from heaven, they saw right then and there he was claiming to be God. So let's look at some of the implications of Jesus as the bread of life from John 6, 48. A, write it in. Jesus is speaking of spiritual bread, not physical bread. John 6, 48 said, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. But they all died. However, the bread from heaven gives eternal life to everyone who eats it. You want people to hear me, huh? <laughs> Either that or I can scratch my face. <laughs> By the way, one of these days I'm gonna I'm gonna watch one of these uh, YouTube uh, things. The only thing I've seen is somebody popped it up on their, uh, their whatever 
they call the internet. The internet. He said, there you are. I said, that old man? He said, yes, there you are. But it is a spiritual bread, the bread of life. What a phrase. The bread from heaven gives eternal life to everyone who eats it. B, as our spiritual bread, Jesus does the following for us. Number one, he saves us. He saves us. I assure you, anyone who believes in me already has eternal life. And you may talk to somebody who has different ideas about how we're saved, but there's something else that's involved in this other than Jesus Christ. Not so. He alone. When he said, I am the bread of life, that was it. Everything else was imitation. Everything else is something that people plan to do. Remember that Satan likes to pretend to be like an angel and bring messages and confuse people. But always come back to the Word. I assure you, anyone who believes in me already has eternal life. Wait a minute, preacher. Yeah, yes, I can see that hand. How do I believe? Do I have to be so, ah, oh, believe. You can kill me, I still believe. No, no. It's just a matter of believing from where your heart is. When I became a born again believer when I was 10 years old, I was uh, attending a church that believed in a lot of emotions. In other words, I felt that I should have some sort of a, an emotional thing when I said, Lord, come into my heart. There should have been a, whoa! So I, I as, as a wise 10-year-old, spoiled brat only child, I received Jesus when I was home getting ready for sleep. I was in the bedroom by myself. And so I pretended to have an emotional kind of thing. And I bragged about it. And I had to apologize later. Because it wasn't that. We're not saved by emotion. We're not saved because we have such faith. <laughs> Sometimes we just begin with a very low level. We just cry out to God, Lord, I don't know what else to do. I'm having such a rough time. All I can do is ask for you to save me. And he will save you. And by the way, once you're saved, in case I die before I finish the message, <laughs> Once you're saved, it's forever. You mean, you believe in security of the believer? Yeah. Not because they're so secure. But because God has brought us into his family. He said, you belong to me. And you may go through some tough times. You may even doubt me. But I still love you and believe in you. When I counsel with people, as a pastor of over 50 years now, I've done a lot of counseling. One of the things I try to do when I'm counseling is 
Number one, let them know that I love them. And I'm not going to get rid of that love. I'm going to continue to love them. But then I say, don't forget, God loves you even more than that. He will never let you go. The Bible says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Does that mean we can go out and act like jerks? Well, some Christians do act like jerks. No, but not nobody here. No. <laughs> it's too bad we don't have a camera we can just stand around. And do it. I'm a jerk. I'm a jerk. No, some do. Does God hate them then? No, He loves them. In fact, the Bible says, you ready for this? Whom the Lord loves, He chastens and scourges every son whom He receives. Have you ever been whipped by Jesus? Oh, are you kidding? Wow. But He still loves me. And he loves you. But I hope I can see everybody's eyes. I want to tell you that. Not because I said it, but because he did. Number one, he saves. Number two, he sustains it. He sustains us. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and overburdened. And I will cause you to rest. By the way, this is from the Amplified. I love the Amplified. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle, meek, and humble, lowly in heart. And you will find rest, relief, and ease, and refreshment, and recreation, and blessed quiet for your souls. And I'm sure there are many of you who could stand and testify to the fact that you've been through some tough times when your old enemy hit you hard. And you had to come to God and say, Lord, I need your strength to get through that. And he's been right there with his hand on your life. And he's gotten you through it. And he will get you through it. He will. Because he loves you. And then number three, on the top of page three, he motivates us to share with others. Look at this. The righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty, and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, I just want to cry when I read this. Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. In other words, sometimes we get frustrated because we help people and they either don't show any appreciation or they don't change their lives and so on. And what are we going to do? Go back to this passage. What you're doing for them is you're doing it for Jesus' sake. And you're trying to help them in their spiritual life. It doesn't say you're always going to be successful, but you keep at it. Never give up. I've got a uh, sign that I want to put on my office door. It's a quotation from, uh, I believe, one of the prime ministers of 
Clinton. I think Churchill was too good. They asked him to give a speech. And he got up and instead of being like a typical preacher going for 30 minutes, he got up and said, Never, never, never give up. And he sat down. And that's what my sign says. I want to put that on my office door. I want everybody that sees it to be encouraged and to realize they need never, never, never give up. And if the enemy is hitting you this morning, trying to hurt you in some way, remember, he wants us to share the love of Jesus with others. Even the least of them is what he said. He did it to me. Finally, I think I told you when I was a youngster, a little boy in church, <laughs> I always waited for the preacher to say, and in conclusion, <laughs> that was a good word. That was like a magic thing. That, that was better than a chocolate milk, you know, and in conclusion. <laughs> because we always went to lunch after the church, you know. So you want to be the first one there at the, anyway, so we get the best table. We celebrate this sacrificial death for us when, for example, we partake of the bread and cup of the Lord's Supper. First Corinthians 11 said, This is what the Lord himself said, and I pass it on to you just as I received it. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread. I'm the bread of life. Remember? And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I want you this coming week, every time you eat a sandwich, <laughs> or a toast, or McDonald's, amen? amen. <coughs> those of us have better taste than others. Right. Just think of Jesus. He said, I'm the bread of life. Every time you partake of the meal, there it is. Very often when God would bless people, uh, I think it was Moses who it was, the angel came and gave, gave him bread and water. Hadn't eaten for a while. Gave him bread. Bread was important. God wants to do some neat things in your life and through your life. And like you said, this church could be at the very beginning of something that, that he really wants to accomplish. And I'm going to be praying for you that way. I hope you pray for North Hollywood first, first southern. We need to have that kind of vision. Let's pray, Father. Thank you so much for this very special church. You've called them, Lord, to accomplish some very unique things in your name. Bless them, Lord. In the days to come, give them vision, give them determination in all things. We place them in your hands, in Jesus' name. Amen.